from around the globe, it's theCUBE. Presenting CUBE on Cloud. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE. Hello everyone and welcome back to theCUBE on Cloud where we're talking to CEOs, CIOs, chief technology officers and investors on the future of cloud. And with me is Dave Humphrey, who's the managing director and co-head of private equity in North America at Bain Capital. Dave, welcome to theCUBE. First time, I think. First time, yeah, Dave, thanks very much for having me. So let's get right into it. As an investor, how are you thinking about the evolution of cloud when you look back at the last decade? You know, it's not going to be the same uh, uh, in this coming decade. You know, it's ironic, 2020 has, has thrown us into, you know, the accelerated digital transformation in cloud. But how do you look uh, at the evolution of cloud from an investment perspective? What's your thesis? That's a great question, Dave. And, you know, for us, we're focused on investing in technology and really across the economy. And I'd say the cloud is the overarching trend and dynamic in, in the technology markets. And really for two reasons. Uh, one is a major shift, of course, that's going on. But the second, and frankly, even more interesting one to us is all the growth that the, the cloud is creating in the technology marketplace. You know, the shift, I think has been well covered, but uh, five years ago, 2015, by our analysis, two thirds of all computing workloads were done on premises. And only five years later, that's, that's flipped. So two thirds of all computing workloads now done done in the cloud. And of course that shift has a lot of ramifications as an investor, but even more interesting to us is the growth in technology and the usage of technology that the cloud is, is creating. So over that same period of time, the total number of computing workloads uh, run has increased by 2.6 times uh, in just a five year period of time, which is really a, a dramatic thing. And it makes sense when you think about all the new software applications that can be created, all the data that can be used by new uh, users and new segments and the real-time insight that can be gleaned from that. And it's that growth that really we're uh, focused on investing behind as, as investors uh, in technology. You know, it's interesting, you, you, you took, took, uh, shared those numbers and you hear a lot of numbers. I, I actually think you're you know, you you're even being conservative. You know, Ginny Rometty used to talk about 80% of workloads are, are still on-prem. Andy Jassy at reInvent said that 96% of the spending is still on premises. So that was kind of an interesting stat. And I guess the other thing that I would, I would note is it's not just a share shift, it is. It's not just you know, the cloud eating away at on-prem. We've clearly seen that, but there's also incremental opportunity as well. If you look at Snowflake, for example, you know, adding value on top of you know, across multiple clouds and creating new markets. So there's, there's that, you know, double, that one, two punch of stealing share from on-prem, but <clears throat> also incremental growth, which is probably accelerated as a result of this, you know, compressed digital transformation. So when you look at the big three cloud players, I mean, roughly speaking, they probably account for $80 billion in, in total revenue, which I guess is a small portion of the overall IT market. So it has a, a long way to go, but, but what's the best way to get good returns from an investment standpoint without getting clobbered by their tendency to sometimes co-opt some of the, the best ideas and put them on their primary services. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, for us, uh, it really comes back to the same fundamental principles we look for in any investment, which is finding a business that solves a really important problem for its customers and does so in a way that's really advantaged versus competition and can do something that other competitors just can't do, whether those be the hyperscalers that you're describing or you know, other specialized and, and focused uh, competitors. And then finding a way that we can partner with those companies to help them to accelerate their, their growth. So surely the growth of the likes of AWS and Microsoft and Google, uh, as you were describing, has been a profound competitive shift along with the cloud shift that we've all talked about. And those companies of course can offer and do things that you know, past purveyors of computing couldn't. But um, fundamentally they're selling an infrastructure uh, layer and there is room for all sorts of uh, new competitors and new applications that can do something better than, than anybody else can. So any company that we're looking at, we're asking ourselves the question, why are they the best ones to do what they're doing? How can they solve the most problem for their customers and do that in a way that's, that's resilient? And we see lots of those opportunities. And I want to, I want to pick your brain about the Nutanix uh, investment, but before we get there, I wonder if you could just talk about Bain Capital and, and their, their history of investment in both cloud and infrastructure software and, and how do those investments, how have they performed and how do they inf inform your current thesis? Yeah, absolutely. So Bain Capital was started in, in the mid eighties, 1984, actually as a spin out of Bain and Company Consulting. And the basic premise was that if we're good at advising and supporting businesses, 
we should partner with them and invest behind them. And uh, if they do well, we'll do well. And as I said, focusing on these businesses that do something really valuable for their customers in a real advantaged way with some discontinuous growth opportunity. That's led us to grow a lot. Uh, you know, we started out actually in the venture business and grew into the private equity business, but now we invest across all life stages of companies and all over the world. So we're $105 billion in assets that we manage across 10 lines of business uh, and we're truly global. So I think we have about 470 investment professionals and 210 of those at this point are located outside the US. One of the really interesting things for us in investing in technology broadly and in infrastructure and the cloud more specifically is that we're able to do that all over the world and we're able to do that across all the different uh, life stages of, of a company. So we have a thriving venture capital business that really we've been in uh, since the origins of, of being capital has invested across countless cloud and security and infrastructure businesses, taken successful companies public, uh, like, like SolarWinds, sold companies to strategics and grown businesses um, you know, in, in really thriving ways. We have a, um, a growth, mid-market growth technology uh, business that we launched last year called our Technology Opportunities Fund. They've made a really interesting cloud-based investment in a company called the Cloud Gurus, uh, Cloud Guru, excuse me, that uh, trains the next generation of IT professionals mm -hmm. to be successful in the cloud. Uh, and then, of course, in our private equity business, you know, where where I spend my time, we are, are highly focused on uh, technology sector and uh, the impacts of the cloud in that sector broadly. We've invested in many infrastructure businesses, scale businesses like BMC software and rocket software, security businesses like Glucose Systems and Symantec. And of course, for those big businesses, they've got uh, both on-premises uh, solutions, they've got cloud solutions, and often we're focused on helping them continue to grow and innovate and, and uh, take their solutions to the cloud. And then uh, this taken us to our most recent investment in Nutanix that we're, we're very excited about and we think is truly a, a growth business in a large market that has an opportunity to capitalize on these trends we're talking about. I wonder if you could comment on some of the changes that have occurred. You guys have been in the private equity business for a long time. And if you look at, you know, kind of the early days of, of private equity, it was all, you know, EBITDA, suck as much cash out of the company as possible. And you know, whatever's left over, we'll figure out what to do with it. And it's, it's, it seems like, you know, investors have realized, wow, we can actually, if we put a little investment in and do some engineering and some go to market, we can actually get better multiples. And so you've got the, the kind of rule of 30, 35 and 40, where EBITDA plus growth is kind of the metric. How, how do you think about that and look at that uh, uh, evolution? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because in many ways, being capital was started as the antithesis to what to what you're describing. Right? Right. So we were started again as, as with a strategic lens and a focus on growth and a focus on if we got the long-term and the lasting impact of our businesses right, that the returns would would follow, and you're right that the market has evolved in that way. I mean, I think some of the uh, some of the dynamics that we've seen has been certainly growth of the private equity business. It's uh, it's become a much larger uh, piece of the you know of the capital markets than it was certainly ten years ago and twenty years ago. Also, with that growth comes the globalization of that business all over the world and the specialization. So you certainly see technology focused firms and technology uh, focused funds. Uh, in a way that you didn't see uh, you, 10 years ago or certainly 20 years ago. Actually, Bain Capital, interestingly enough, we had a technology focused fund in 1989 called, called Bain Information Partners. So we've been focused on the sector for a very long time, but you certainly see a lot more technology investors uh, than, than you did you know, 10 and 20 years ago. How are you thinking about valuations these days? I mean, that is good, it's good to be in tech. It's even better to be in the cloud, you know, software, cloud, you know, if if and if you're looking at you know some of the companies, especially the work from home pivot, but a lot of that appears to be you know many people believe it's going to be permanent. H how are you feeling about the both public market and and private market valuations and that dynamic? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's amazing, right? I don't think any of us uh, in in March when the COVID crisis was just emerging would have anticipated that that come November the the markets and certainly the technology markets would be even more robust and stronger than, than they were say in January, February. But I think it's a testament to uh, the resilience of the technology uh, and the, just how intricate and intertwined technology has become with our daily lives and, and how much companies depend on its use. And frankly, it's been uh, the COVID environment has been an accelerant for many of the ways in which we depend on technology. So witness this interview, of course, through, through the, through the cloud and you're seeing the way that we operate our business day to day, the way companies are accessing their data and information, it's only further uh, accelerated the need for technology and the importance 
um, of that technology to how to how businesses operate. So I think you're seeing that you know reflected in the in the market uh, values out there. But you know for us we're we're focused on businesses that still have that catalytic opportunity ahead that can you know more than compensate for uh, for the price of entry. So let's talk about this massive investment you guys made in Nutanix, 750 million. Well, I guess it's a small piece of your 105 billion, but still a massive investment. How did that opportunity come to you? What was your thinking you know, behind that, that investment? And what are you looking for in terms of the go forward plan and growth plan for 2021 and really importantly beyond? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're, we're thrilled to be partnered with and invested in Nutanix. We think it's a terrific company and uh, you know our most recent technology investment in our private equity business. It really came about through proactive efforts that uh, that we had in, in the spring. Um, you know, we've got a team focused on the technology sector, focused across infrastructure and applications and uh, internet and digital media businesses and financial technology. And uh, you know, through those efforts, we were looking for businesses um, that we felt had faced some dislocation and their market values associated with the COVID environment that we were facing, but that we thought were really attractive businesses, well-positioned, um, had leading solutions and had substantial and discontinuous growth opportunities. And, and as we looked through that effort, we really felt that uh, Nutanix stood out just as a core leader and in fact, um, really the innovator and the inventor of the market in, in which it, it competes with a substantial uh, market share and position solving a really important problem for its customers with a big growth opportunity ahead. But um, the stock price had had come down because the business has been undergoing a, a transition. And we didn't think that that was fully understood by, um, by the market. And so we, we saw an opportunity to partner with Nutanix to invest money into the business to help to fund its transition and its growth. Uh, and to, to be partners uh, along for all the value the business will, will continue to create. We think um, it's a terrific company and, and we're excited to be, to be invested. Well, you and I have talked about this, that transition, you know, from a traditional you know, license model to, to one that's a, a, an annual recurring revenue model, which many companies uh, have gone through. Uh, I, you know, you, you, Adobe certainly has done it. Uh, Tableau successfully did it. Splunk is kind of in the middle of that transition right now and, and maybe not well understood. Uh, you've got companies like, like Datadog that, and Snowflake again, to doing consumption-based pricing. So there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace. And, and I wonder if you could talk about uh, that transition and, and how, why it, 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 it was attractive to you to actually you know, place that bet now. Yeah, absolutely. And as you say, a number of companies at this point have been through uh, various forms of, of this shift from, from selling their technology up front to selling it uh, over time. Uh, and, and we find that the, the model of selling the technology over time uh, is one that can be powerful. It can be aligning for customers as well as for the um, vendor of, of the software solutions. And in Nutanix in particular, again, we saw all of the ingredients that um, that we think uh, make this uh, an opportunity for, for the business. Again, market leading technology that customers love that is uh, solving a really important problem. The technology, because Nutanix had been grown and, and bootstrapped under the leadership of, uh, you know, of, of Dirage when it was, uh, was built and founded, um, had been selling its software together with an appliance, uh, you know, often in a um, upfront sale uh, and has been undergoing under their own initiative, a transition from selling that software uh, with an appliance to a software based model to one that's more rattle over time. And, you know, we thought that there was the opportunity to continue that, uh, to continue that transition. And by doing that, uh, to be able to offer more growth and, and more innovation that we can bring to, to our customers to, uh, to continue to fund that shift. So something that frankly was well underway uh, before we invested, um, you know, as the, as the business makes this transition from collecting upfront to, uh, you know, to, to more evenly over time, um, you know, we saw a, a potential use for our capital to help to fund that growth. And we're just focused on being a good partner to help the company keep investing and innovating as, as it continues to do that. I was talking to somebody the other day, Dave, and I told him I was interviewing you and I was mentioning the Nutanix investment. And I said, I'm definitely going to cover that. And, as part of this, you know, Cube on Cloud program, and they said, well, hit Nutanix, that's not cloud. I'm like, well, wait a minute, what's cloud? So we heard Andy Jassy at, at reInvent talking a lot about hybrid. Antonio Neri, right after HPE made its uh, earning, last earnings announcement, 
he came on uh, and, and said that, well, we heard uh, the big cloud player talk about hybrid. And so the definition is changing, uh, but so how are you looking at the market? Uh, certainly there's this hyper-converged infrastructure, but there's also this software play, there's this cloud play. Help us squint through how you see that. Absolutely. So Nutanix, as, as you alluded to, pioneered the market for hyper-converged infrastructure for bringing compute and storage and networking together, uh, you know, often in private cloud environments in a way that was really powerful for, for customers. And they, of course, continue to be the leaders in, in that marketplace. Um, but they've continued to innovate and invest in ways that uh, can solve problems for customers and related problems across um, the hybrid cloud. So combining both the public cloud with, you know, with that private cloud and across multiple public clouds with things like clusters and lots of innovation that, uh, that the business is doing in partnership with the likes of um, Amazon and Microsoft and, and uh, others. And so, you know, we think that Nutanix has a powerful role to play uh, in that hybrid cloud world, uh, in a multi-cloud world, and, and we're excited to uh, back them in. Well, I think too, what maybe people don't understand is that not only is Nutanix, you know, compatible with AWS and compatible with Azure and GCP, but it's actually trying to create a, an abstraction layer across those, those clouds. Now, there's two sides of that debate. Some, some will say, well, that, that, that has latency issues or it, it, yes, it, it reduces complexity, uh, but at the same time, it doesn't give you that fine grained access. That's kind of the AWS narrative. Customers you know, want simplicity and we're seeing you know, the uptake across clouds. I, I have a multi-part question for you, Dave. So obviously Bain very strong in strategy. I'm, I'm curious as, as to how uh, much you get involved in the operational details. I mean, obviously 750 million, you've got a stake there, but what are the two, to, two or three major strategic considerations for not just even just Nutanix, but, but cloud and, and, and software infrastructure companies and, and how much focus do you put on the operational and what are the priorities there? Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, we pride ourselves in being good partners to our businesses and in, in helping them to grow, not just with our capital, which I think is, of course, important, but also, you know, with our sweat equity and our and our human capital and our partnership. We do that in lots of ways. It's fundamentally about, um, you know, supporting our businesses, however, is needed to help them to, to grow. Uh, we've been investing in the technology sector, as I described, for over, over 30 years. And so we've built up a set of capabilities around things like um, helping to partner with the sales force of our, our companies, helping them to you know think about the you know the ways in which they um, they allocate their uh, their uh, research and development and their um, and their innovation ways in which they um, you know continue to do acquisitions to you know further that pipeline. We support our businesses in lots of ways, but you know we're not engineers, we're not developers. Of course, we're looking for businesses that are fundamentally great. They've got great technology. They solve problems for customers in a way you know, that we could never uh, replicate. That's what's you know, amazing about a business like Nutanix in just over a 10 year period of time, it literally has customer satisfaction levels that we haven't seen from any other infrastructure software company that we've had the, you know, the, the pleasure of uh, diligencing over the last several years. So what we're focused on is how can we take those great products and offerings that Nutanix has and continue to support them through the further growth and expansion in areas like um, you know, the, the further Salesforce investment to expand into these new areas like clusters that we were talking about and uh, thinking about, you know, things that they can do to further expand the, the strategic hold. Um, and so, you know, we have a, a large team of being capital, uh, as I mentioned, um, 260 investment professionals in our private equity business alone. About a third of those are just available to our companies to help support them, uh, you know, with various initiatives and efforts af after we invest and we'll certainly, of course, make all of those available uh, to new tanks as well. Somebody was asking me the other day, uh, you know, what's hyper-converged infrastructure? How'd that come about? And I was explaining, well, back in the day, you had, you'd buy some servers and some storage and you'd have a network and you'd sort of have different teams and you'd put application, you'd figure it all out and put the applications on top, you know, test it, make sure it all works. And then, and then the, the guys at VCE and VMware and Cisco, and the EMC, they got together and said, okay, we're going to bolt together a bunch of different components and you know, pre-test it, here you go, here's a, here's a skew. And then what Nutanix did was actually really transformational and saying, okay, look, we can do this through software. Um, and, and so, and now that was what, late, late 2000s. Now we're sort of entering this new era, this next generation of cloud, cross clouds. 
So I wonder how you think about, you know, based on what you were just talking about, the whole notion of M&A versus organic. There's a lot of organic development that needs to be done, but perhaps you could you could buy in uh, or inorganically through M&A to actually get there faster. How do you think about that balance? Look, I, I think that uh, that was an articulate, by the way, explanation of, I think that the origins of uh, hyper-converging infrastructure. So I enjoyed that very much. But, you know, I, I think that, um, with any of our businesses and with Nutanix, we're of course looking at where are we trying to get to in several years and what are the best ways to support the business to, to get there. You know, of course they'll, um, you know, primarily that will be through or continued organic investment in, in the company and all the innovation uh, in the product um, that they've been doing. Uh, will the company contemplate acquisitions to further achieve the development goals and the, and the objectives for solving pain points for customers to get, you know, to the, Strategic places they're trying to get to, of course, uh, but you know, it, all as a part of the of the package of of what's a, a good fit for the company and its growth objective. I mean, with the size of your portfolio, I mean, you're a full stack investor. I would say, is there any part of the the so-called tech stack that that you won't touch that you would actually you know not not walk but run away from? <laughs> uh, well, you know, I wouldn't say that we're running away from um, uh, you know anything, but the questions that we're asking ourselves are: is the Technology that we're investing in durable uh, is it uh, advantaged and 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 does it have a growing role in the world and you know if if we think that those things are are true we're absolutely um, thrilled to invest behind those things you know if if there are things that we feel like you know that's that's not the case um, you know then then we would tend to to shy away from those investments we've certainly found opportunities in businesses that people perceived as one but you know we believe to be another. Well, so let me ask you specifically about, about Nutanix. I, I mean, clearly they achieved escape velocity. One of the few companies actually from last decade, it was you know, Nutanix, you know, Pure, not a whole lot of others that actually, you know, were able to, to maintain independence as a, as a public company. Um, what do you see as their durability, uh, their, 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 and their moat, if you, if you will? Yeah, absolutely. Well, clearly we think that uh, it's a very durable and very advantaged business, um, you know, thus, thus the investment. Look, we think that um, Nutanix has been able to offer the best um, hyper-converged infrastructure product in the market, uh, bar none. Um, uh, one that has got the best ease of use, uh, is, is, is the most nimble and flexible for, uh, for customers. And you just see that, you know, resoundingly in customer feedback and, and also that plays across very heterogeneous architectures in a way that, you know, is really, really powerful. Um, because of that, you know, we think that they're best positioned to be able to leverage that technology as they have been uh, to continue to play across both public and private uh, hybrid cloud environments, and so we're excited to you know to back them in in that journey. It really starts from solving an acute customer pain point you know better than anybody else can, and uh, you know we're looking to uh, to back them to continue to expand that that vision. Yeah, well, I've talked to a lot of Nutanix customers over the years, and and that is the fundamental value proposition is it's really simple, very high you know customer satisfaction. So that that makes a lot of sense. Well, Dave. Thanks very much for coming on theCUBE and participating in theCUBE on cloud. Really appreciate your perspectives. Wish you best of luck and hopefully we can do this again in the future. Maybe face to face. Yeah, face to face maybe someday even. No, Dave, I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure and um, good luck with, with the rest of your interviews. All right, thank you. We'll keep it right there everybody for more CUBE on cloud. This is Dave Vellante, we'll be right back.